not to talk about Fieldstone. I do. I do. In fact, I love to talk about Fieldstone. How'd you know? Because this is something to talk about, which is sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone, which offers innovative and compassionate care, is now accepting residents at their lovely facility uh, on Rolling Bay today. So you can schedule an appointment to get a tour. Call 360-271-2530. That's 360-271-2530. Do it today. <laughs> and welcome, David Harrison, for... A discussion of what a week in politics it has been. Oh my gosh! And uh, and it's kind of uh, well, it's kind of scary to a lot of uh, Democrats the way that the elections went. It was, uh, it is, but I'm going to try and get into that. See if we can together sort out how fright we should be, to what extent that fright is. It, whether what extent an alarm has sounded and what the significance of it is. The trouble with punditry, of course, is, is there gets to be a central story, and then that's the story until it isn't the story. So, so uh, let's try and sort that out. As is my practice, I'm going to go in sections, and I'll stop after each one. So first, <clears throat> I, I think... Uh, I need to talk a little bit about what's going to happen between now and the holidays because it, sorry. <clears throat> I'm gonna start by talking about what's gonna happen in Congress between now and the holidays because it speaks to what happened in Virginia and, and New Jersey. So uh, first I'm gonna talk about all this legislative stuff much of which, uh, if you've been on with me before, we've talked about before. And then I'm going, in our second segment, to talk about what that all has to do with what happened in Virginia and New Jersey and what we are to think about it. And then third, in our third segment, uh, what our strengths, our weaknesses are uh, in the upcoming year, what are our chances a year from now, um, how it's looking and what the recent results had to do with that. So first, let's go over again. Uh, some of you know this stuff cold and some of you don't, but let's uh, 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 go into what's been happening. Um, as you um, will remember, Biden all this year has had uh, a three-part strategy the American Rescue Plan, the American Jobs Plan, which is the infrastructure bill, and this uh, new bill uh, record th accomplished through the reconciliation process where he only needs 50 votes and it's on what they're calling human infrastructure, meaning social services and education and some work on climate change. That's been the plan from the beginning and taking it together, the three things after we accomplished them, will be as monumental of a set of governmental changes as we've had uh, since the New Deal, certainly the equal of the Affordable Care Act. So I'm here to tell you, if you're on social media or someplace where somebody superimposes the picture of Joe Manchin on, on Mitch McConnell, that's so stupid. Mitch McConnell would not, if he had a chance uh, vote for any of these things and hasn't, didn't vote for the, the, infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So what we have, uh, and I'll, I'll go over it uh, really quickly, is monumental new investment and policy change. The fact that it isn't equal to what uh, Bernie Sanders wanted us to have was going to be the story ever since we got to 50 votes. If we hadn't won with Donald Trump's help, the two votes, the two cases, the seats in Georgia, we wouldn't have gotten any of these things, but it's pl uh, pleasant that we did. And as you're sticking pins into the Kristen Cinema doll or uh, Mitch, uh, Joe Manchin doll, you should remember that. So in the American Rescue Plan, that was the first reconciliation bill where we only needed 50 votes. We spent a monumental amount of money on COVID, on responding to COVID, on grants to uh, states and cities, 
uh, including, as some of you who follow know, $7 million to the city of Andrews Island, half of which is going to be spent on affordable housing. And monumentally, uh, in that bill, uh, we provided extended COVID-based unemployment benefits to a quarter of America's workforce. It was huge. And we passed a new child tax credit that will could, uh, if we continue it, decrease child poverty by half in America. So already you're, you're looking at a Joe Biden achievement that, that it was uh, stunning, I think. And then with nine Republican votes, uh, the Senate passed, the House has yet to pass an infrastructure bill called the American Jobs Act, which includes everything from charging stations for electric vehicles to highway and bridges to the single biggest public investment and in public transit that has ever taken place. So that is about to pass uh, the House and unlikely to be any changes so they won't even need to go to conference and they'll sign an infrastructure bill that is bipartisan that if they had passed it two weeks ago, uh, we would have won the governorship of Virginia, I think. I think what we're guilty of, and we'll talk more about this, is governing in public. All these battles between the House and Senate, Manchin and the other, and Bernie, and House progressives versus House moderates are all part of a legislative process that you can expect, especially if you have narrow margins. However, the independent voters of Virginia were not that impressed by it. And it made the discussion be about the war rather than what the war was being fought over. So at any rate, um, as by the, um, uh, so we were guilty of, of uh, governing in public. What will happen between now and the end of the year is uh, Nancy Pelosi will pass both bills this week, the infrastructure bill being uh, settled. The, human services and education and climate change bill. She's going to put a couple of things in it that Joe Manchin won't buy. Um, so what you may remember is at the beginning, the parliamentarian decided they could do a second budget reconciliation bill that would only need 50 votes. And Bernie immediately announced it should be $6 trillion worth of expenditures. A lot of that is just covering a greater period of time. It's not new programs, but it included at least two, three things that uh, aren't going to happen. One is dramatically expanded uh, Medicare to include uh, uh, dental and uh, optical and so forth. The second is six, eight weeks of family leave when uh, someone as a child. And the third is Universal Community College. So those are big democratic ideas, very New Deal-like, and uh, none of them will be in the final bill. Uh, not just because uh, they cost a lot of money that we would have to borrow, but in the case of community colleges, we don't have agreement on who should get, we have a great community college system in Washington, state that I used to have something to do with. And um, we don't all agree that that kids whose parents make $300,000 a year should go to that system for free. So there are some policy differences. At any rate, uh, that's what was the difference. A lot of getting back to $1.75 trillion, which Joe Manchin is willing to agree to, comes in shortening the time periods and pulling those three things out. So what do you end up in and what will pass? First, Nancy Pelosi will pass something. It will be different from the Senate version. They'll set up conferees, have a conference. Joe Biden will be leaning on them heavily. And sometime by, uh, no, sometime in late November, they will agree to this third piece of the package. The reason I know that is because the following people understand that it is essential for electoral success next year. 
Charles Schumer, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, Pramila Jayapal, Bernie Sanders, every progressive, every liberal, every moderate in the House, they all know they have to have this bill. And that's why they'll have. They knew that last week. They just could not move themselves fast enough to do it before the Virginia vote. The reason for that is it's all about leverage in public. So uh, the House progressives refused to pass the physical infrastructure bill because they wanted more things in social services and climate change than Joe Manchin would ever agree to. The only leverage they had was to refuse to pass that bill. And it made some of us disappointed, but it's a tactical matter. They were absolutely right. Uh, Pramila Jayapal is from South King County and she has acquitted herself extremely nicely. Those of you who are fans of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, what Pramila has is a certain deliberateness and calm which moves us toward ultimately resolving these things. So she's a good choice. Uh, she used to run One America in South King County, which was about immigration uh, reform and helping refugees. Anyway, so that's what we're gonna end up with by the end of the fall. Uh, I'll stop there and for questions or thoughts. People say, why isn't Joe Biden more active? That's crazy, he's active every day. He's infinitely more one-on-one -on -one active uh, than, than uh, President Obama uh, was wanting to be, uh, who kept uh, some uh, distance from, from horse trading. Biden's an old senator, he knows all these folks. If he could have gotten, he got a framework before he left for Europe. If he could have gotten more, he would have. It's all a relic of having only 50 votes. It uh, gives enormous leverage to vote number 49 and 40 for uh, 50. So if you're leaning more progressive and you don't want Joe Manchin to hold you up, then go get yourself some more senators and then he won't be able to. Um, politics is all about proposing things, working out what to do and then doing it. And as I said, what we're guilty of in this case is governing in public and independent voters in Virginia and uh, North New Jersey saw the great gridlock and weren't thinking so much about what was being worked on. So let me stop there uh, and talk and let's talk about where all these legislative things stand. And then if we're comfortable with that, we'll move on to what happened in New Jersey and Virginia. So you seem pretty confident that both, I mean, you called them three pieces. One, I assume, is the, yeah, the COVID American, piece that we already have that yeah. we're benefiting from. The second is the infrastructure bill. And the third is the human. Uh, that's right. Services. And human and climate change. I should say that that $1.75 trillion includes $500 billion in carbon emissions incentives. A lot of that is not regulation, it's making things that reduce carbon cheaper, quite notably a proposed huge reduction in a tax, a huge increase in a tax credit you would be able to get for buying an electric vehicle. And that's why they're putting in all the charging stations there. They're trying to move us to a point 10 years from now where the, and now that they have stronger, faster, bigger electric vehicles are trying to move us away from internal combustion, which could kill us. So that's why they're trying to do it. So is there a risk that the that if the uh, progressives don't continue to hold that uh, climate slash human infrastructure bill hostage, uh, it may just die and we get the infrastructure alone? Oh, uh, no. Um, uh, there's, there's some sort of guarantee in there or the progressives would not allow the physical infrastructure bill to be voted on this week. Joe Biden and Joe Manchin have said something to them, even as they, as there's fighting back and forth. Uh, basically, Joe Manchin doesn't want his nose rubbed in it. 
And every time they do something that angers him, then he says, well, I don't have to vote for this. But you know that they wouldn't be voting. Pramila would not be voting on the, uh, in the physical infrastructure bill unless she has a guarantee on the rest. So my uh, these are all, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a local pundit. You can disagree with me. I think the chance that they'll walk away at the end of the year without the third bill is zero. That's my Anyone opinion. else? Looks like Pat's coming to the... Yep. So I'm, I'm just curious, David, if you um, heard um, James Carville the other night, you know, with his... Um, he was on the PBS News and was basically after the elections and was basically saying it's so much of it is the way Democrats talk about it. And they're just hanging themselves by um, using, you know, uh, dramatic language. Um, any rate, it, it actually got quoted in The Times the next day because he, I thought he was incredibly articulate. You know, why are we using this, you know, defund the police and, you know, and, and, he, and he used Seattle as an example about five times. He said, when even a progressive city like Seattle votes much more moderately this time than um, might have been expected, we need to take a close look at what the language is that Democrats are using. So I was just curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, and this will help us go into the Virginia, New Jersey discussion. So I myself <clears throat> believe that the term defund the police costs us eight house seats that Pelosi needed to have. I do not think that it was a wise choice. And I do not think it advanced the necessary action that 150 or 200 cities have taken in terms of reform of police practices. There is an argument in, in the police reform community that it was so provocative that it caused us to move further and faster. I, I just don't believe that is true at all. I think uh, a national movement to reform police practices that was defined thusly would have done just as well or not better. And it was a self-inflicted wound. In terms of the broad, oh, and with regard to Seattle, I think the city council uh, um, has forgotten the, the daily business of running the city and that the election of Bruce Harrell and uh, the woman who beat Nikita Oliver was a vote by uh, to to redress that, and I think that it also signals the reemergence of the Seattle Times. For a long time in there, <laughs> the, the uh, stranger, which is on the ropes fiscally, had as much I think political influence as the Times, and that's how. Um, uh, um, uh, so on, uh, beat Richard Conlon in the first place through the stranger, and the council started to go in that direction. I think this is uh, uh, the basically Seattle liberals did just beat Seattle progressives. In terms of its national significance, I, I'm, I'm not betting that, that we will ever, as liberals and progressives achieve uh, a discipline with regard to our articulation of things. I think we should accept that it's a messy party. I think uh, Joe Biden already knows what he wants to say in January. He wants to say the COVID or April, we're on top of the COVID and uh, we've the economy is growing significantly and we are attending to new in new ways to the future and so forth and so on. I think the reason why um, Democrat, the why Carville gets annoyed is remember when Bernie or Manchin or somebody speaks from the outside end of conventional or what Carville thinks they're trying to advance their position. I mean, it is about, I, I promise you, if they hadn't held up the infrastructure bill, that there wouldn't be $500 billion in carbon emissions incentives. So 
Carvel's right. We don't always run like, we don't always work on government like we want to persuade independent voters. But I think, I don't know that that's much of a manageable problem. I think who carries the dialogue next year will be the candidates themselves. So if you run the kinds of people that we look like we're going to nominate against the kind of people that it looks like Donald Trump's going to nominate, I think that that uh, that bodes well. So let's go to that New Jersey, Virginia issue, unless people have more to ask or say about this fall's uh, legislative agenda. Sheila. Yeah, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, ways of talking about different types of things like defund the police and so on and so forth. The Republicans really made high hay with the CRT thing, uh, critical race theory. And uh, I mean, it, it caught, it caught, uh, caught hold, apparently, mostly in Youngkin's thing, apparently, from what we understand. And I'm just wondering, you know, that doesn't even exist except in a civics course in master's class in a college, you know? I mean, it's, it's insane. So I'm just wondering what you do about that. Well, so a lot of things were happening in Virginia at the same time. So remember, I guess Biden won Virginia by uh, 10 points or what? What is that? By 10 points or so. 10 points. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's what you were saying. I thought you were, I don't know. Um, so, uh, so keep in mind that some of that is uh, uh, people running, uh, independent voters uh, having a predilection to vote against the party in power. Uh, so there's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of weariness with Terry McAuliffe. I'm tired of Terry McAuliffe and I don't live there. I, when Ralph Northern won, he was an all new person. And I'm just saying that you, you run somebody who used to be governor years ago and then was a national official. I, uh, Glenn Youngkin was fresh, Terry McAuliffe wasn't. Glenn Youngkin is the rare candidate who succeeded in not being saddled by Trump. Ever since the California recall, Democrats have got it that if you can wrap Trump's mantle around a candidate, that's gonna help you with independent voters. They did not succeed in doing that with, Young, with Youngkin. The good news for the upcoming sessions is there aren't that many Youngkins around, former CEOs of this or that, who don't have a record of sidling up to Trump. Trump's, there's not gonna be very many of those, luckily. Um, I do think critical race theory at, uh, was used in a bewildering way, something that nobody knows anything about, but is definitely, it counts as a mark against us. Um, I think that's even more bizarre than blaming uh, defund the police on us, where Biden from the beginning corrected that. I think uh, it uh, it reminds us that all politics is ultimately local and that our candidates next year are going to have to have some, especially gubernatorial candidates are gonna to have to have something to say about the schools. It's odd because of course, Everything we do with regard to COVID prevention in the schools pose, pulls that to 70%, but we're still fighting, swimming upstream against this undercurrent that we're pushing parents around, and we will definitely have to attend to that. So my summary is, with all these things, we could have won Virginia. We only lost by 70,000 votes, and we could have won New Jersey by more. But it's good to remember that even if we had, there would be a signal and that would be a signal that parties in power have a hard time winning off year elections. So let's, let's go to that a little bit more. Uh, before we do, are there thoughts, more questions about uh, New Jersey or Virginia? Um, yes, Maria. 
I just want to say something really uh, uh, quickly about critical race theory. Um, I'm an academic. Uh, 40 years ago, we separated history and critical studies. The French post-structuralists were coming in, postmodernism. I don't want to get to all that. But we had feminist theory, critical theory. And it, it, the basic idea is history is not neutral. Is coming from a point of view. And we had LGBTQ. We also had critical race theory. It was only in the law schools. The law schools had courses showing the systemic racism within legal systems. We're talking 40 years ago. I don't know. The right usurped the term postmodernism and they usurped this term. I don't, I don't know when and how, but it's a, it was very clever of them. That's all I can say. Uh, yeah, I think so. And I'm I mean, I don't think there's 10 Republican leaders who could even define what they mean. But I think the signal is Republicans, that Democrats want our children to feel bad about themselves, and Republicans don't, that we do, I do, feel that a discussion is or in order, continues to be in order with regard to institutional racism in America and that slavery and the, the 150 years after continues to be a stain upon our history and that there be, should be discussions of those matters in the schools and not just those. We, we took over physical space that was occupied by another people, indigenous people. So um, I don't know how we will express the language that doesn't shy away from that obligation, but I know that we have to. And the other thing that Republicans are doing, of course, is, is defining the interventions in these three bills as socialism. That's interesting. It's, uh, it's so far from a Northern European liberal socialist model, it's, I mean, it's light years away. But they wouldn't be doing that if they weren't able to get some traction from doing it. So we'll have to figure out what to do about that. It goes to what is our pluses and what is our minuses. So let's, let's take that up for a second. The minuses are off your election period. And we've got a lot of people who are part of that 81 million votes or getting us the 81 million votes who are sitting on their couch. They, they sustained an incredible amount of postcard writing, calling, money giving, energy for four years. And then they stopped and let Joe Biden governor govern and they need to get back up uh, off the, the uh, couch. The, we have against us right now, uh, we own COVID. Trump abdicated, we own COVID. Now, once COVID is not the way we live, that 250 million doses of later or 300 million, Joe Biden can be the man who brought us out of the pandemic. But right now, independent voters are voting that things are not right in America. And they're not saying, well, they'd be a lot better if Donald Trump had been a decent president or any of that stuff. They're voting on how they feel about how things are going in America. There's a jobs report this morning that we had 500,000 new jobs, unemployment rates down to 4.7%. Joe Biden's bet on the good news side is that these three sets of legislative packages will resonate with Americans in a profound way. He's talking about it all the time. It's not true that he's not talking about it. It's, he's just not getting through beyond the political disputes. But he's hoping, especially in swing states, that what he has put into this package is, will carry the day as a sound of agenda for America. So you look at the states that are the firewall three years from now, and our critical Senate races one year from now, North Carolina, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and such. And the three pieces of legislation are designed to win in those states and to ultimately uh, rebuild the firewall 
and not have presidential elections be so close. So the first piece of good news is that eventually we'll be talking about what those pieces of legislation do. The second piece of good news, of course, the bad news being that we we could we could lose the house, especially in the off, just because of here, here's the number. Going into the you know, last November, the generic uh, vote on uh, House races was 7% plus for Democrats. Because of gerrymandering, you have to win by 4% or so just to pick up five seats. And we did a little less than the 7%. We didn't do that well in the House. That is, generic vote is down to 2%. Uh, Biden is under 50% in his approval, though not as low as Trump. So these numbers have got to pick up. The number one way they can pick up is uh, the agenda getting passed and starting to take hold. And all of a sudden it's May and job and the economy is going well. And uh, this, there's not another surge and we're down to 200 deaths a day. And it's not just uh, vaccinations, it's the new treatment pills. And all of a sudden we feel like the country is opening up again. Uh, Biden will get the credit for that, and he'll take the credit for it, and and uh, that'll be good. What else do we have going for us? I mentioned before, uh, uh, demographic destiny. The number one group of Trump-like supporters is white males, and they've never been a smaller percentage of voters in America because of the increased uh, Latino and uh, Asian American and African American populations. We need to continue to register uh, uh, voters of varying ethnicity and youth, of course. And uh, that, of course, is why the Republicans are trying to suppress the vote in Arizona, Texas, and Georgia. So that's the good news. We do have the ground troops. We have good candidates emerging. It is not inevitable from the November results that we're going to lose a year from now, but it certainly is a signal that we need to get these things passed and get back uh, to our campaigns. Questions, thoughts, and concerns. That's what I've got to say for today. Um, Tom, yeah. I was just going to I was just going to say that uh, you lay these out uh, in your blog ourunfinishedwork.com some of these pluses and minuses uh, yes, which I, I know. which people, people might can, find enjoyable. People could continue to receive can receive that uh, by emailing me at dsh347 at gmail.com I'll put it in the chat. Um, and you can get on that list that goes to a thousand people and another thousand people read my blog on Facebook. So you could follow me or friend me on Facebook. But every two or three weeks, this uh, blog comes in and it's been heartening for me because I started with a hundred Bainbridge friends, sending it to them. and Everything since then has been word of mouth. So it's been very heartening. That's great. Sheila? Yeah, I wanted to know, uh, when are you coming back with the cockeyed activists? Um, so I started a little group called the cockeyed activists, and then I stopped basically having to do with some health issues, and I'll be back. I'll send a note in the next couple of weeks, and I'll be back this fall. That's a Zoom uh, discussion of people who are especially obsessed with these matters, and I have special guests and so forth. Well, we always appreciate you being a special guest. Well, I'm happy to do it, and we'll continue to do it as long as there's at least one other person <laughs> besides me who wants to talk. 